Heavenly Father, we pray that we might be as honest as children. Jesus said that unless you come as a child, unless you are childlike, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So Lord, help us to be like they are, not childish, but childlike. Lord, as we come to your word, give us ears to hear it, and give us eyes to see it, help us to understand it, and help us to put it into practice, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, if you'll turn to 1 John chapter 3. Page 1022, I think, if I heard her correctly. 1022 in the Pew Bible, if you brought one. A reminder that in the bulletin, there's a place for you to scribble down some notes. If you learned something you didn't know this morning, write it down where it says head. If you're called to believe something about God, about yourself, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, write it down where it says heart. And then find something to take with you today. Don't just hear it here and then walk out the door and forget about it, but find some way to apply it, I hope, to your life. Got a question for you. What do you call a cow that no longer produces milk? An utter failure. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Ever feel, ever feel like a failure in life, a failure in your Christian walk? I have another question for you. True or false? It's a statement, not a question. True or false? Give it a second, let it sink in. God loves you even though you are a spiritual failure. God loves you even though you're a spiritual failure. So as we begin to look at our passage this morning, John wants us to understand certain truths. Truth about us, truth about God, truth about the world in which we live. And if God is God, then God loves all of us. But does He delight in us? I mean, if we're spiritual failures and we're a constant and chronic disappointment to God, and we feel like spiritual losers most of the time, then we have this image of God in our minds of that He's got a sneer on His face. He rolls, there goes Matt again, and He rolls His eyes. He's, he's kind of snarky about us. Now, He's God, so He has to love us. But does He like us? Does He delight in us? And so, no, we're not perfect. Yes, we commit sins. But here's what John wants us, needs us to understand. If you've got your Bibles, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See. It's a command. It's an imperative. My wife went to nursing school at the University of Maryland. And she lived in a boarding house in downtown Baltimore. And she had a Hispanic roommate, not from America, who loved to go wander around. And she was just amazed by everything she saw because it wasn't anything like where she came from. And she'd constantly say to Cheryl, Sis, sis, mira, mira. Look, look, mira, mira. Look at this, mira, sis, mira. And she's constantly just pointing it just stuff that we take for granted. But for her, it was amazing. Mira, mira, look, look, see, see. That's John right here at the beginning of this passage. Irate. It's a command. It's an imperative. See, look, behold, pay attention. I don't usually like the NIV, the nearly inspired version of the Bible. Um, <laughs> But in this case, I like how they paraphrased uh, this verse. It says, look, see, look how great is, instead of our says, see what kind of love the Father is. Look how great is the love of the Father for us. That's what John wants us to understand. The statement that God loves us but we're spiritual losers or failures is not true. It's false because God delights in us. God wants us to know that we are His children. And what does it mean for us to be the children of God? It means that the world that we live in is an orphanage and that we're bereft and we have no one. And God Himself comes and He points and says, I want you. I want you. I want you. And he points and he chooses us. And he adopts us. And now we have a family. And now we have a father. It doesn't matter how good or bad your earthly father was. You have a heavenly father who wants you, who delights in you, who wants you to be his. I love the Heidelberg Catechism. And the Catechism puts it this way. That the Son of God... From the beginning of the world to its end, out of the whole human race, gathers 
and protects and preserves for himself by his spirit and by his word a community destined for eternal life. And of that community, I am and always will be a living member. I'm a member of a family. I've been invited into a community by God's choice, not necessarily by mine. He is the one from the whole beginning of the earth to its end out of the whole human race, gathers and protects and preserves us as his children. We're beginning to get a picture of what God's love for us is like. He doesn't put up with us. He doesn't tolerate us. He delights in us. He loves us. He loves me. He loves you. And I struggle with that because there are a lot of times I just, I don't feel it. And so here's the good news. We're, we're, our relationship with God is dependent on our faith. We're justified by faith, not on the basis of how we feel. So it's true about us whether we feel it or not. And John wants, before he begins his argument here in chapter 3, he wants to drive home the, the reality of our identity. Who are you? It's not about what you do in bed and what is your sexuality and my identity is this or that. We don't need to hear about that. That's not your identity. Your identity is, as a follower of Jesus, is that you are a child of God. And that comes as, as no small thing. C.S. Lewis, in his classic book, The Screwtape Letters, if you haven't read it, you should. It's one demon writing to a younger demon on how to mess up the life of a Christian. And he says this, surprisingly. Now, he calls God the enemy because he's a demon. And he says, listen, it's not as easy to tempt people into hell as you might think it would be because the enemy, God, because the enemy has this curious fantasy that he's going to turn all these human little vermin into sons and daughters. It's not a fantasy. That's ultimately God's desire for each one of us, that we become his son, we become his daughter. And John says, well, if you, if you didn't believe me the first time I said it, listen to what he says now. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are, whether you feel like it, whether you live like it, so we are. That's who you are in Christ. You are a child of God. That's your primary identity. That's who you really are. That's what you need to understand to live the way that you're supposed to live. And that He loves you. And He delights in you. Verse 2. No, I'm sorry. Second half of verse 1. The reason... Now, there's consequences to being the child of God. And the consequence is this, the world doesn't know us. No, they don't know us. They don't get us. We're simple-minded people. We're a bunch of buffoons that follow charismatic leaders. We're credulous, not very intelligent people. We believe in myths and fairy stories and fairy tales. And that's what the world says about us. They don't know us. They don't understand why we're committed to the things that we're committed to and why we don't agree with the way that they operate and the way that the world works. If you've got your Bibles, just turn back one page. 1 John chapter 2. No, the world does not know us. Why? Because this is the world, beginning at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, those things are not from the Father, but they're from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, they don't get us. They don't know us. Why? Because they're all about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. This humanistic world, worldview that operates in the absence of the church is trying to draw all of us in, trying to conform all of us to its image. I love J.B. Phillips in um, the uh, New Testament for Modern Man. Romans chapter 12, he says, Do not let the world press you into its mold. We come out of the womb and the world is pressing us constantly to agree with them 
and to be woke and to follow in their PC footsteps and to say that good is bad and bad is good or that what's real is false and what's false is real. It's insanity. They don't know us and we should not capitulate to their thinking and their way of life. There's two words for world in the New Testament. One is cosmos. God so loved the world, the cosmos, all that he created. And I expected when I looked in the Greek at this verse about the world, I thought I was going to see the word ion, from which we get the word eon. It's about the age. This present age is another way New Testament writers talk about the world. Actually, it is cosmos. But this world is an age, this present age. And who's in charge of this age? The God of this world, says the New Testament. The prince of the power of the air. It isn't Jesus. It's Satan and his minions that are operating, trying to draw us away from our Father, trying to deny our identity, trying to tell us that we're worthless, useless, trying to tell us that we're credulous and stupid, trying to tell us that we're simple-minded, that we're followers, not leaders. Those are all lies. And they come to us from Satan. And that we aren't to believe those things. Why? Because they didn't know Jesus when he was here. I love the message, John 1.14. Jesus put on flesh and blood. God put on flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood. Was Jesus available? Could we see him? Could we touch him? Yeah. And they didn't know him. Some tried to use him. Oh, Jesus, I'm hungry. Would you feed me? Oh, Jesus, I'm bored. Would you do some magic tricks for me? Oh, Jesus, uh, I've got uh, lumbago. Will you heal my back? But how many of those people loved Jesus, who knew him, who desired to follow him and become like him and became one of his disciples? John chapter 6, he had great crowds following him. He turned around and said some hard things to them, and off they went. They weren't serious about him, and they were not children of God. But that's not who John says you are. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is it didn't know Him. Now beloved, we are God's children. Do you get He's trying to help you understand your identity? Who do you belong to? Who are you in the deepest part of yourself? You are a child of God. And what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. That's awesome. I don't know if you heard that or not. The end of verse 2. When he appears, when he comes in glory to judge the living and the dead, when we behold him, we will become like him. Right now, we're justified by faith so that we're forgiven for our sins, just as if I had never sinned. But when He appears, we won't be justified. We will be just. Peter says we will share in the divine nature. We are going to look and be like Jesus is. That's what we, it means for us to be children of God. Christians live in this world in three arenas. The first one is, what are we? We're children of God. The second one is, what will we be? We will be like Him. We will be like Jesus. No sin. We will give up our mortal body and our immoral soul for an immortal body and a moral soul. We will live in fullness and completeness. Or as it says in John chapter 10, the Good Shepherd says, I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. We will experience life to its fullest and abundantly the way that God intended us to experience life as His children. And this world will pass away, but a new heaven and a new earth will come. And we will rise in resurrection bodies and we will be like Jesus. He has a body. He's not some disembodied spirit sitting on a cloud. He has a body. And we will be like Him. And we will have a body. And our bodies will be like His. I'll be 16 again and I'll have hair and my shoulder won't hurt. And I can eat whatever I want and never gain a pound. Is that heaven or what? <laughs> That's what it means when He says when we see Him, we will be like Him. It will be amazing to experience. It will be amazing to see one another. We'll recognize one another, even though we're going to look darn good <laughs> and feel even better. When we see Him, we will be like Him. But when does that happen? Not yet. Already, 
That's the promise, but, but not yet. When we see Him, it's on its way. Okay, for the first arena is what are we children of God? Second arena is what are we uh, going to be? We're going to be like Him. And the third arena, and now John begins his transition to the second part of our outline. The first point is children of God. The second one is the reality of sin. Sin has interrupted this world. Sin has broken into this world, and sin has made a mess of things. So sin is real, and that's negative. If you want to put it positively, God begins the work of transformation. Here's the promise of transformation, and it begins here in verse 3. He says this, Everyone who thus hopes, hopes in what we will be like. These are promises that God makes to us. Peter calls these precious and magnificent promises. That we will be like Him. We'll get a new body and everything will be the way that it's supposed to be. Don't we long for that day? Don't we realize that there's got to be more to the world, to life than just this? That there's better and more and it's yet to come. And so he says, everyone who... I'm sorry, verse 3. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. If we're going to be like Jesus and Jesus is pure, then he's beginning to make us pure. We begin to reflect his character. We begin to become like he is. And this is a process, and it begins in the here and now. And so we, it's what are we, what will we be like, and what ought we to be? Who should we be as children of God? And so he transitions from children of God to now he's telling us what we ought to be like. He says in verse 4, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. In the Greek construction, they're synonymous and they're interchangeable. Lawlessness is sin. Sin is lawlessness. A son, a child of God cannot be lawless. Lawless is to reject. Now when he talks about law here, he's not talking about the Torah. He's not talking like Paul. Paul talks incessantly of the law and he's talking about the, the moral constraints of the law, the cultic law, the sacrificial law, the kosher law. John's not talking about that. He's talking about God's character. That lawlessness is to reject God's character, to reject the way and the person of who God is. It's rebellion against God Himself and God's person, His character, who He is. That as children of God, we're to reflect that and to become like that. And when we sin, we're in rebellion against God. I love Emil Bruner, Reformed theologian of the last century. He said, we've been caught with the bloody instruments, the guns of our rebellion, the bloody instruments of our rebellion in our hands. We're caught red-handed. And yet, we can lay down our arms. We all know the verse, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. Another rendering of that is, Cease your conflict, or lay down your arms. Stop your rebellion and know that I am God. That's God's call for His children. Lay down your arms. Stop sinning. That's rebellion, lawlessness against God and who He is. Now, what He's not saying is this. That if you sin, you're not a Christian. If you've sinned, you've lost your salvation. He is not saying that. We struggle against sin in this life. That's just the human condition. Um, some of us have a besetting sin. A sin at which we are the experts and we do it better than anybody else does. And it doesn't mean if we have a besetting sin that we're not a follower of Jesus or a child of God. He says here, everyone who makes a practice of sinning. Here's what he's trying to describe or get through to us. We are to hate sin. We are to fight against sin all our mortal lives. And everything that comes to us from the world is a temptation and we fight against it. Who he's talking about in practicing sin are people who have capitulated. People who have just given up. They've made peace with sin. I'm going to keep doing it and they are okay with it and they don't care anymore and there is no effort being made to hate sin or to fight against it. Now when I say hate sin, I'm talking about your own sin. Your sin. I'm not talking about other people's. You need to mind your own business. You don't go out and hate somebody else's sin. Their sin is their problem. Here you deal with your sin. 
And you confront your sin. And you fight against it. And you're serious about it, serious enough about it, that you're willing to make yourself accountable to other people. So that somebody besides yourself knows what your besetting sin is, knows what your struggles and trials are, and that you are transparent and authentic and allow yourself to be known by another. As Protestants, so I confess my sins to God. Now, then, you, then you forgive yourself. No, we need to take the fight against sin seriously and allow others to speak God's truth into our lives. You remember last week, the descent into darkness. First, we give up our fellowship with one another. We quit going to church. And then we say, I'm the only one in the house and the lamp is broken. And we say, I didn't do it. I'm the only one in the house. Who did it? Yeah, right. I didn't do it. And then utter darkness is, well, I'm a good person and I don't sin. And I'm, I never do anything wrong. And we convince ourselves of that. Nobody is, is that. That's what John was saying in the first chapter. What he's talking about is that when we sin, it breaks our hearts. And we confess our sins to another person and to God. And then he promises to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What he's talking here in verse 4, what he's talking about is the person who just gives up. And who goes on their merry way, sinning and lives in the world and pursues the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. And they don't care about the consequences. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. Teenage girl's out with her friends and she's at a pizza joint and they're just hanging out together and drinking soda and eating pizza and messing around and having fun and then somebody comes up with this great idea let's go to safety turn and let's get a case of beer and let's go hang out uh, at safe that's where we went when I was in high school safety turn and let's go hang out at safety turn and just see what might happen if we have a case of beer and um, and the girl thinks for a moment and says no I don't think so and she says can somebody give me a ride home and then there's snickers, and there's people mocking her and making fun of her. And, and uh, one of the boys says, well, are you afraid you'll get in trouble? Are you afraid your father's going to hurt you if he finds out what you're doing? And she says to him, no. I'm afraid that if I go with you, I'll hurt my father. Not my father will hurt me. John isn't writing this to scare us straight. He's not writing this to, so that we'll be afraid of being punished somehow. He's not even writing this to assure us of our salvation. He's reminding us of our identity. And this little girl knows who her father is. And she knows that if she behaves in certain ways, that that will hurt her father if he's to find out. And so she, she just won't even entertain it. And she gets somebody to take her home, despite the opprobrium of the world and the way they put her down and the way that they mock her doesn't matter that's the way that we are to love God as the children of God not settle for sin not allow sin in but to fight against it and why did Jesus come John reminds us look at verse 5 you know that he appeared in order to take away sins John the Baptist is hanging around with a couple of disciples and Jesus his cousin shows up and he says hey Look, irate, same word, irate, mira, mira, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We just celebrated Easter. Who is Jesus? He's the Paschal Lamb. He's the sacrifice for our sins. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be my sin. All the stupid things I say, all the various ways that I hurt my wife and my children, all the, all the dumb things that I do, that became Jesus. And he hung that on the cross along with himself in order that I might share in his righteousness. Again, not in following a bunch of external rules, but righteousness means right relationship with God. That I'm in right standing with God. That I'm a child of God. He's hearkening back to the first verse. That I am a child of God. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And why? Because in him there was no sin. He's the mediator. He's the sacrifice. There's why we can be the children of God. Verse 6. And no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. We don't make peace 
with sin in our lives. John is taking sin seriously. He's not trying to scare you that you're going to lose your salvation. He's not trying to make you feel guilty. But he is trying to tell you that you need to fight that battle, that war. The, the biblical word is sanctification, to become like Jesus. And it's a struggle and it's a fight every day of our lives. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. If we know Jesus, if we know what he's like, if we know his character, then why would we do things that would hurt him? And then he finishes his argument, verse 7, my little children, I love John. Again, he's in his 80s, 90s, everybody is half his age, even the oldest people. They're, they're, his, oh, they're all his grandchildren. And so he takes them into his lap and he reminds them of something. And what does he remind them of? Let no one deceive you. See, even in the earliest days of the church, there were deceivers who went out into the world teaching wrong things, heresy. I have a friend who wrote a book. The book is called The Cruelty of Heresy. Why is heresy cruel? Because it leads you out of the church and out of the faith, and it leads you on the path to hell. So all heresy is cruel because it promises you all kinds of positive things, and it ultimately leads you down the primrose path to hell. If you've got your Bibles, just turn one page to the right. Second John, it's just one little chapter, one little epistle. And in verse 7 he says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world. It's not just the world system that we fight against, but that the world system has some dupes that are out there, and they will use whatever ploy they can, whatever psychological manipulation. They're deceivers, and they've gone out into the world, and it's worse than that. Turn one more page to the right. The book of Jude, beginning at verse 4. Jude says this, this is the brother of our Lord Jesus, written at about the same time as John's writing his letters. For certain people have crept in, in what? Into the church. Certain people have crept into the church unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master, Jesus Christ. These deceivers in John's day were known as Gnostics, G-N-O. We get the word knowledge, K-N-O. We get the word knowledge from that. They had knowledge. They understood things that we don't understand. They're like the Masons. And if you give them some money and you get into their cult, they will in instruct you about their knowledge. And what is it that they taught? Two lies about sin. First is that sin just doesn't matter. That's not what John is saying. John says sin is a deadly matter and we need to pay attention to it and we need to fight against it. They had a muddled morality. They did, what did Jude say? Things filled with sensuality and lust. And, and those are people even, Jude says, that are within the church. Look around at some of the churches and the things that they teach. They're teaching what Jude said, what John is saying. Don't John says, let anyone deceive you. The second error that they lied about is, well, okay, it, it, there are spiritual sins and you're a spiritual person and you're going to go be in the spirit with God. And so what matters is spiritual sins. But, but it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It doesn't matter uh, if you have sex with strangers. And just what doesn't matter. That stuff is physical. It just doesn't matter. Again, that's a lie. Verse 7, John says, Beloved, my little children, don't listen to these deceivers. Their muddled morality and their sideways living is apparent if you just look at it. It is contrary to Jesus and the way that Jesus lived his life, and you know that they're not telling the truth, and you know it's not real. By your fruit, Jesus said, you will know them. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as Jesus is righteous. Again, whoever walks as a child of God in right relationship with God. And at the end here, what he wants to make sure that we understand is that doing is being. Who we say we are, who we understand ourselves to be, shows itself in how we act, in what we do. Do not let the deceivers fool you, take you in. And he wants us to know that sin takes us away from God, and he wants us to know 
that it doesn't have to because we are God's children. Amen.